Chairman, it's, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. I, I guess some of you would be rather talking about the EU referendum and others of you might be so bored by it all. You are missing Boris Johnson, I think. Uh, but I'll try my best to entertain you. Of course, as you get older, you think more about death because it's inevitable. And of course, how you're going to die and when you're going to die is pretty important. And as you get older, you want to go on living. And I know, you know many young people feel that, well, when they get to 60, 70 or 80, they might just as well die. But when you get to that age, you want to go on living. <laughs> so I think it's a pretty important aspect of this to think about what you can do about your own life and particularly avoiding illnesses that are rather unpleasant. You can't always do that. And also about how we could increase population uh, life expectancy and in particular uh, before you stop working because that's when it is very cost effective. And what's been realized in the last 20 years or so is that we now understand what causes what's called cardiovascular disease, that is strokes, heart attacks, and heart failure, which is the biggest cause of death in the UK. And we're getting a much better understanding of uh, what causes cancer, which is the other big cause of death, and looking at the environmental issues and so on. And there's been in the last 10 years a big uh, group of people working on the global burden of disease with the WHO, funded by Bill Gates and others. And they've been looking at the global picture and individual countries to see what are the important risk factors for causing uh, death and also causing disease burden. And I'll just show you recent publication from The Lancet. This is looking at underlying factors for death in the world. And you'll see that the biggest one is unhealthy diet. And we'll come on to what I mean by that. Then blood pressure, which was the biggest cause of death. That may surprise you. I'll say a bit more about that. Then, of course, we're all aware of tobacco smoke, and that has been reducing, although increasing, in developing countries. And then air pollution, you'll have read about, and obesity, type 2 diabetes, cholesterol still there, and, of course, uh, physical activity. That's not because it impacts on this. It's because taking more exercise has a lot of benefits independent of that. Um, and, <coughs> and if we look at the UK, and this is looking at the globe, the burden of disease, this is uh, life-adjusted years, and it's not looking at death, it's looking at the impact of those diseases on society and on you as an individual. You can see again that unhealthy diet is the biggest thing, smoking is the next one, obesity, <laughs> blood pressure, uh, type 2 diabetes and cholesterol. So you can see and then uh, the same there as uh, ki kidney impairment. You get the same picture again and again in every country. And that's true even in developing countries outside some areas of Africa where obviously HIV is still a major cause of death and malnutrition is. And malnutrition is still a problem in some of these countries, but certainly not a problem in most countries in the world now. Now, sorry. What is it we mean by unhealthy food? And that's quite simple. The, it's largely ultra-processed foods produced by the global food industry and, and sugar-sweetened drinks. And the problem with them is they're stuffed with salt, right? They're stuffed with fat, particularly saturated fat and palm oil, and they're stuffed with sugar. Now, the salt is the major reason that you put up your blood pressure. You remember, blood pressure was a major cause of death. But those unhealthy diet, this is independent but probably additive to it, so it makes it even more important. The saturated fat, in spite of some publicity recently, is quite clearly the major factor in putting up your cholesterol. I'll come back to explain that in a bit more detail. And that is what causes atheroma, narrowing of the arteries. I'll come back to that. And then, of course, the fat and the sugar are in these very calorie-dense products. That means for a small amount of food, you've got a huge amount of calories stuffed with sugar, and fat, and they give you no feeling of fullness or satiation. And we'll, I'll describe some of those foods in a moment. And they lead, of course, to obesity. And if you get fat, you're more likely with abdominal obesity to get type 2 diabetes. And I'll describe a bit about that. And also increasing evidence now that diet leads to cancer. Obviously, salt is a major factor in causing gastric cancer. <coughs> a high fat intake and also obesity leads to many other forms of cancer as well. And sugar, of course, has the unique, unique 
uh, ability to cause dental caries. Without sugar, we wouldn't get tooth decay. Without sugar, you wouldn't have any problems with your teeth. So it's crazy to eat all the sugar, and it's a big problem for children, mission to hospital for pain, for tooth extraction, and so on. But I'm not going to say more about that at the moment. Now, why are we getting so fat? Now, it doesn't, doesn't need a PhD in nutrition. It's actually blindingly obvious, and it was shown on the next slide. These are two fat American children, and they're eating a Big Mac, large chips, Coca-Cola. Now, what's the calorie equivalent of that meal in oranges or bananas? Now, you may get a bit of a surprise, because it's 18 oranges or 11 bananas. Well, the thing is, we could go out now for a Big Mac, chips and Coca-Cola, and two hours later we'd have another meal, couldn't we? We'd have dinner afterwards. These, this food gives you no feeling of fullness, but you try eating 18 oranges. <laughs> you won't eat for two days, right? So it's, not, it's common sense, of course. And of course, those people who say, oh, you can burn it all off, you know, burn it all off. These two children have to run half a marathon each to burn it off. Well, it's a bit unrealistic. Every time you have a Mac, ch chips, and Coca-Cola, run half a marathon. So you can see how exercise really plays no role except in Olympic athletes and bicyclists and footballers in, in controlling obesity. And, the, and, it, and of course, it's impossible to avoid this food, and I'll come back to that now. I mean, where is this food? Well, sorry, it's, it's first of all, it's very calorie dense, I've said. It's incredibly cheap, and it's very profitable because the ingredients cost nothing. I'll just give you an example. There's a disgusting snack called a Dairy Lee Lunchable made by Kraft, which is some dried biscuits, some uh, highly processed cheese, and some dried-out salami, and it's quite disgusting. <laughs> the sale price, uh, the, the ingredient cost as a percentage of the sale price is less than 10%. Right? The packaging is 15%. The marketing is 40%, and the rest is pure profit. Well, if you think about selling an orange or an apple, you can't do that. And you can see why this food is so attractive to the food industry. They can still make money on healthy food, but less money. Of course, as we just said, it only gives you a transient feeling of fullness, and it, 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 you eat more of it. And also, the amount of salt and sugar and fat is deliberately chosen to give you just the right salty, sweet, sort of, uh, get the, the, the fat makes it smooth to eat. And this is very attractive, particularly to children. And, and they, they much prefer these foods, once they've got used to them, than the, any food you might cook at home. So the, the, to some extent, the food is getting addicted. Uh, it's getting as addicted to this food, then they can make more money. And of course, this brilliant marketing we can get them any time. Everywhere you go now, this is foods, bookshops, garages, everywhere. There's all this rubbish, right? And any time of the day or night. And they get brilliant marketing of it uh, and spend billions uh, advertising. As soon as I just gave you the Dairy Lee Lunchable, 40% of the budget is on advertising and marketing. And it's not surprising that people eat more. Now, some of us can resist it. If you look in this room, there are very people, few people overweight. And you can resist the temptation of these foods, but poorer people, it's very difficult because they don't have cooking facilities, have, very often don't have a microwave. And what do they do? They go out around the f food takeaway, buy something for a quid, and that gives them a reasonable meal. You know, so it's not surprising that obesity is common, much more common in poor people. But that isn't to say that salt intake isn't high in you and me, and your fat intake is quite high, and you've probably, unknown to you, got high blood pressure and high cholesterol because they're much more hidden. It's obvious to see whether someone's obese, but you can't tell you what your blood pressure is or cholesterol. I'll come back to it. Of course, portion size has increased tremendously. This is going back to the 1950s, increase in a burger, chips, Coca-Cola, uh, and popcorn. So you can see big increase in, in, in uh, portion size as well. Now, <coughs> coming back now to the individual risk factors, what about blood pressure? There's a very important thing here to realize is the risk is throughout the range. If you look here, this is the blood pressure level in a population against the risk, increasing risk of a stroke. And you may be aware that high blood pressure, which is defined as a 
systolic of 140. So that's, if your GP measures your blood pressure, that's when he'll think, oh, we better check it, is it sustained? He might put you on treatment, because there's very good evidence that giving drugs to lower blood pressure prevents the strokes and heart attacks. But below this level, look, the line goes right down, and it starts at a systolic of 115. And there are very few people in this room who've got a systolic of 115, right? Now, when your GP says your blood pressure is normal, it's not normal. It just means it's not going to need treatment with drugs. We don't think it's justified at the present time. It may become so. And look at this. You see that it goes right down here. Now, if you look at these people, they're obviously at much greater risk, but there are much fewer of them. So the actual number of strokes occurring in those people with blood pressure in the so-called usual or inverted commas normal range is the same as those occurring with high blood pressure, and exactly the same thing applies to cholesterol. So obviously, if you're looking strategically at how to prevent strokes and heart attacks and heart failure, you're obviously going to think about treating these people up here, but you've got to take population measures to lower blood pressure. And remember, this is the biggest single risk factor that we can measure that, that causes death, blood pressure. So why is it so dangerous? Well, first of all, the pressure itself can burst vessels. And this, for those of you who are not familiar, is a cross-section of the brain in a man who died of a cerebral hemorrhage. The, bur the vessels burst here. Blood's come out. It's clotted now. And it's pushed the brain across. You can see it, it's pushed over like this. this. Because the brain is in the skull, it's pushed down into the brain stem. And that's what kills you, is compression in the brain stem. It's not the hem hemorrhage itself. Um, and this is not now a major cause of death, but lacuna strokes, what are called lacuna strokes, which are da direct damage to the, the blood pressure causes in small vessels in the brain stem, where all the nerves are conjugated together that control movement, sensation, and, and so on. A small damage there will cause major damage, and that's why you get the left, you know, left-sided paralysis, uh, and depending on which side of the brain is unable to speak, or the other side. And, and that's directly due to blood pressure. And then, of course, you've got heart failure, which is directly due to the pressure of the heart. If you've got a higher pressure, the heart as a pump has to pump harder, if, and it, it fails because it can't pump against a higher pressure, particularly if it's already damaged by coronary artery disease, and then kidney disease also causes it. But by far the commonest cause of death that blood pressure causes is atheroma. And that's been slightly forgotten with all the publicity about salt and sugar, that we're all developing these deposits these in our arteries, right? We all got fatty streaks in our artery, which are cholesterol deposits, and over it is a fibrous cap. And that doesn't do you much harm until the artery is 70 to 80% blocked, because there's a lot of redundancy in the artery, so they're much bigger than we actually need. So you have to narrow it right down to get impairment of blood flow. But unfortunately what happens is the, the cap of the plaque, the fibrous plaque, gets destabilized and can shear off, as shown here. It's like taking a loop of skin and cutting it and you've got a, a round sort of ulcer. And platelets and red cells are, uh, come in their clot and are healing that, that uh, uh, cut there, you see. But of course, this is the carotid artery. This is the external carotid artery. This is the artery that goes up here. You can feel it in your neck, common carotid here. And then it goes up, divides to one artery that supplies your face and a major artery to supply that side of the brain. Right? So this is the internal carotid going to the brain. This is going to the face. But you can see that this, this has blood going by 60 times a minute. Right? And this knocks off bits of platelet and red cells, what are little called emboli, they go into the brain, damage the capillaries. That causes dementia. In the heart, it causes damage to the heart muscle, and you get failure of the heart because it's damaged to the muscle. Or in the kidney, it causes progressive renal damage. So you can see how these are very important in causing chronic uh, disease. But this is the main event. <coughs> this is where the plaque has split. Platelets go in. Red cells form a clot. That comes out into the artery, and it blocks it. And this is what happens in a heart attack. And this is the commonest cause of death in the UK still, although it's gone down a lot. And that is you block one of the coronary arteries. Blood can't get by. That area that supplies 
has no blood coming to it, doesn't have enough oxygen, and that bit of muscle dies. And that, of course, can kill you, uh, or it, you can survive, but with a damaged heart. Here, what we've got is this is the main one of the main arteries supplying the brain. This has been clotted, causes a huge uh, damage to the brain beyond it, and this man died as a result of it. Now, if the, the factors that cause atheroma are first, you have to have a sufficient cholesterol. That requires a sufficient fat intake to form these deposits. And nearly all of us in the UK have a fat intake that's high enough to get cholesterol deposits. The next thing is smoking, which accelerates the deposition. And blood pressure accelerates the deposition of fat in the plaque. But it's also the main factor destabilizing the plaque. If you think your artery is going like this rather than just relapsed, it's much more likely that it, it will destabilize this plaque or cause this fissure here. So you can see how blood pressure plays a critical role in doing the damage when you've got atheroma. And all of us have got that disease. You don't see much about it. It's gone out of fashion recently. But I'm sure some of you who are older will know well about it because it is the major cause of cardiovascular disease. This is what your plasma looks like after a British breakfast. Uh, or a McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> that is fat, right? And uh, that is the other factor that comes in here. Now, what about obesity and type 2 diabetes? Some confusion. Obesity, of course, leads to higher blood pressure uh, and often associated with higher cholesterol. But abdominal obesity leads to insulin resistance. That is, you, 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 get, you, you, you have a normal insulin level, but your blood sugar is much higher than it should because the insulin's not working, right? And you get type 2 diabetes, which is a metabolic syndrome, part of which is, is high blood sugar, but it has other effects, and it can accelerate the disease I've just been talking about, so you're much more likely to get a heart attack, a stroke, or peripheral vasculars. That's the muscle uh, blood flowing to the peripheral limbs is impaired, and you get various things with that. But you also get disease of the small vessels, which is unique to type 2 diabetes. This causes uh, <coughs> retinal problems and eventual blindness. The damage to the small vessels of the kidney causes renal failure and dialysis, and this causes ischemia of the legs and, and gangrene, so the leg actually dies and you get infection and then you have to have amputation. So you can see this is the major cause of blindness in the UK the major cause of need for renal dialysis, and the major cause of amputation. And those are very expensive for the NHS to manage, and that diabetes already costs £10 billion a year and is estimated to go up to £25 billion, which will completely bankrupt the health service. There's another lesson from these guys. The, if we think back, are there any humans living what the lifestyle that we developed on, uh, and that is a hunter-gatherer existence, and there are a few left. They've more or less been killed by Brazilian and Venezuelan loggers taking over the jungle. This is a Yamamamo Indian who's an incredibly fit 75 kilo uh, Indian who's you know, much the same weight as you or me. And they still lead, or did lead, a hunter-gatherer existence. And they were very carefully studied in the 1980s. People went to live with the tribe, measured everything in them. And what they found Sorry. Their diet consists, there's no salt because they don't have access to salt. There's very little fat. There's no refined carbohydrate, particularly no sugar. They eat predominantly fruits, vegetables, and roots. And they get very little meat because it's very difficult for them to catch animals. There's a sort of naive view that these, uh, you can easily catch an animal, but you need a rifle or a, a um, arrow or something to kill them with, and they don't have that. They're very aggressive and they're fit, and they spend most of their time tribes fighting each other, pinching each other's wives. So the idea that vascular disease is due to stress is obviously not clear. We're actually leading a much less stressful life than we did during evolution. Um, and in the adult male, the average blood pressure is this, 96 over 61. Cholesterol is 3.1. The average in the UK is 5.5. No rise with either of the age and no vascular disease. And if you look at our nearest uh, uh, evolutionary animals, you know, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, 
but on their normal diet, they have exactly the same blood pressure and cholesterol. So you can see how we're all operating at far too high blood pressure and far too high cholesterol uh, uh, because of the diet that we eat. So coming back to this, we've been through all this. I don't intend to go again through it, but this is the problem. The sugar, the fat, saturated fat, and salt. You can see a little bit more about why these individually ca cause these things. Now, who's responsible for this state of affairs? What are we going to do about it, right? And obviously the food industry say, it's up to you. You can go to the supermarket, you can choose. You don't have to buy this rubbish, uh, do you? You know, you can buy healthy food and yet they're spending billions pushing these unhealthy foods, then the, the government, of course, is responsible for everything, but it, doesn't, it can't really take blame for this. It's obviously important to try to organise an environment, and I'll come back to that, and you need government support. But the people to blame are, of course, the food industry. They're putting this stuff in. Now, 20 years ago, you could have said, well, we didn't know that. But now they're very well aware of it. They know they're slowly poisoning us all, and they have to take it out. It's quite simple. They're poisoning us. They're doing it. They're making a lot of money at the same time and killing us, and they have to do something about it. And they don't have to make unhealthy food. They can make healthy food. They don't have to kill us, right? Different from the tobacco industry. What can we do? Well, we can obviously tax salt foods with unhealthy things in salt, sugar and fat, they're about to get a, a sugar, sweet and soft drink tax in the UK. But in other countries, they're, they're sort of keen about taxing salt. Certainly unhealthy foods are taxed in Hungary and some other uh, com countries. We could subsidise healthy food. You can have a negative and positive VAT system so that the more unhealthy the food, the higher the VAT, the more healthy you put a positive VAT on, so you subsidise it. But that is a good idea, but is somewhat unrealistic at the present time, but it may come in eventually. Obviously, we can ban unhealthy food advertising. If you think about cigarettes, and it was obviously involved, not directly, but in all the stuff about cigarettes, the, the idea you could ban cigarette advertising in the 1960s, you thought I was completely mad. And yet we will see a complete ban on advertising. I'll come back to that eventually. It will take time. Uh, restrict availability, much more difficult. Reduce portion size, and by that I mean stopping, you know, schools having all these takeaways all around them and all these things like that, and not having food instantly available, unhealthy food instantly available, reduce. But by far the most effective thing is to make the food that they're producing more healthy. And that's what I want to say a bit more about. It's very powerful the food industry. It's the biggest industry in the UK and in many other countries in the world. It's uh, got big influence over the government and it contributes to the Conservative and Labour uh, parties. So they, they call the shots when it comes to things. And you see that again and again. You'll see it with the obesity plan that Cameron's coming out with because it's been very watered down by the food industry. And there are some similarities to tobacco and it took 50 years to overcome that. But I would stress that the, 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 the food industry has the option of not making unhealthy food. And of course they spin a web of influences. This was from the British Medical Journal about all the people advising the government about sugar. And all of these people had in some way uh, employed, related or paid by the, sh the food industry, either through research grants, on advisory boards or whatever. So you can see, you've got to realise that when people give dietary advice, you read in the papers, you've got to be very careful, are these people really independent or are they saying something on behalf of the industry? So I want to say a little bit about what we did in the UK because we led the world on slowly reducing the amount of salt in the food. We're going to start doing that with sugar in the next few months and we also want to do it with fat, particularly palm oil because palm oil has huge sustainability issues as well. Um, now, when we thought about salt, uh, <coughs> this is the amount roughly in the UK and the rest of the world, about 10 grams of salt a day. During evolution, we let at less than half a gram, right? And the target was to get it down to five grams. I'm not going to go into all the evidence about it, but it's overwhelming. So the, what we decided was that the food industry, and in, with the government playing a major role, need to slowly reduce the salt on oil foods by 50% by setting incremental targets. What do I mean by that? 
well, first of all, to get people to do something, you have to have huge publicity about it in the media. So the food industry is aware, and particularly the politicians are aware, that they have got to do something. So you get them so fed up and so continuously getting parliamentary lobbies, questions, and so on. So they're pretty expert at doing that. And this is quite a good one. Uh, this is Jamie Oliver. Some time ago, he's played an important role. We worked with him closely, but he was a, very much a salt addict at the time. And you can see he had some pasta, uh, and his balls, his meatballs, were very high in salt. Uh, and I quite like this <coughs> headline that may appeal to you. I don't think Jamie liked it very much, but anyway. Um, so you've got to get the publicity, you've got to get the food industry motivated to do something, and the politicians. And so what we did was, with the Food Standards Agency, we were very fortunate, I won't go into all the details, we set progressive salt reduction targets for 2005, 2008, 2014 for more than 86 categories of food. So what I want to explain what that means. A gradual reduction, 10, 20 percent, uh, and then no rejection by the public uh, because you don't even notice it's happened. And this is amazing policy when you think about it because the food industry is slowly reducing the salt, and this can be applied to sugar and fat, done slowly, you don't even notice. It's fantastic for public health because it's done at very little cost. The food industry bear the cost, and the costs are pretty, pretty small. There's no need to change the diet. Now, of course, I'm not saying we would love people to change what they eat, but they won't. Uh, that's the point. I mean, they will not. And yet, you reduce the salt, sugar, and fat, so you get a fall in blood pressure, a reduction in obesity, and a reduction in cholesterol. So it's a brilliant policy because the food industry don't lose sales, right? Anything where you tax them or restrict advertising, they get very heated after seeing the reaction to the sugar tax from British Soft Drink Association and Coca-Cola and others. Uh, whereas this, they can't get worked up because they don't actually lose sales. They don't lose money. So although they're not enthusiastic about it, that's what they're going to do in reality. And these are some targets. I don't want to bore you with it, but this is bread, which is the biggest source of salt in the UK. The bread we eat, you may not be aware of that. And you can see the target was 2010, 1.1, then 1.9. And you have a level playing field, all the companies doing the same. And this is what actually happened to the salt content of bread in the UK on surveys we've done. came down by about 25%. Without you being aware of it, you don't know. How many in this room know that the salt content of bread has come down by 20, 30, 40% in the last five years? One person. Two. Well, well done. So it just shows you, you can change the food environment without people even knowing it's happening. That's brilliant public health policy because it affects the whole population and particularly affects the socially deprived. And that's what we want to get at, poorer people who don't have the knowledge that you have, and particularly because those products can, that they eat have more salt, more fat, and more sugar, so the actual reduction is bigger for them than it is in you and me. This is the actual results of the UK salt reduction. It was quite well documented by the FSA, and we were able to pull the results together Here's the fall in salt intake over this period of time. Here's the fall in population blood pressure, taking out people on treatment and correcting for any other factors, although most of them went the wrong way. And here's the fall in stroke and heart attacks. Now, not all of this fall is due to this, because obviously there's this reduction in smoking, slight increase in fruit and vegetable consumption during this time, but a big rise in weight during this time, which has gone the other way, and type 2 diabetes. So quite, quite a big proportion of this was due to the salt reduction. And we can calculate the absolute minimum. <coughs> it's prevented 20,000 strokes and heart attacks a year in the UK just by this simple manoeuvre. And NICE calculated, the, that's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that it, it cost about five million a year, which was mainly wasted by the Food Standards Agency. You probably won't remember it. Television advertising, complete waste of time. But the healthcare saving costs or 1.5 billion a year. Now that really is substantial. It's the most cost-effective public health policy that's ever been devised, salt reduction. Now that's been copied all over the world now, and there are now 70 countries who have salt reduction programs based to a large extent on the UK experience. Now it struck us 
some time ago that sugar was very like salt. You know, it's only a recent addition to our diet. It's not a normal part of our diet. Only when the slave trade and cheap sugar came in, we started uh, eating. And of course, you may be aware, Queen Elizabeth, the first, not the second, she was rich enough to afford sugar. And she, of course, dem had advanced caries. And that's why she never got married. She had completely black teeth. That's, uh, you may like to think about that. Um, anyway, there's a lot of, I've just written them there, I'm not going to go into details, but sugar's like salt, and it's the, but in, in terms of health, it's not toxic like salt, it doesn't put up your blood pressure, although there are a few uh, dietary nutters who claim that sugar's very dangerous, fructose and all that, when you look at the evidence, it's pretty appalling, to be honest, we can discuss that, if any of you are present tonight. Um, it's a major source of empty or hidden calories, particularly in sugar sweetened drinks, confectionery and all that. And it certainly leads to obesity and diabetes. And here, we're all aware, this is the United States, that sugar consumption, weight's gone up, type 2 diabetes has gone up. Of course, because you see it, it doesn't mean to say they're causative. You know, the other, if you plotted televisions here, it would have to show the same, same graph, you know. So be a bit careful. Uh, and of course, it's hidden in food like salt. You're not aware of the salt in all these foods. And like sugar, you know, who had known that a a latte here, or whatever it is, some frappuccino, is it? I don't know what it's like. It looks disgusting, but it's full of fat, <laughs> and it's got 11 teaspoons of sugar. We found another one at Starbucks that had, how much was it? 26, 26 teaspoons of sugar in it. Admittedly, it was a pretty big, it was a, just under half a pint, or a, just under a pint. Uh, but, it, I mean, imagine that. But look at this amount of sugar. Tomato soup, you know, four teaspoons of sugar in it. So we could do the same for sugar like we can for salt. Um, we could start reformulating. But there is a problem when you think about it because it's all right in, in sugar-sweetened drinks and liquid products because you can take the sugar out without affecting the volume. But if you take a biscuit, which is 60% sugar, right, and you realize that those biscuits you had at tea are 60% sugar. Now, I've stopped eating them. <laughs> <laughs> I never realized it. But if you take out... Say you reformulate and you take out 50% of the sugar, the weight will come down by 30%. So you've got a big problem then because you've got a much smaller biscuit and do you put something back? And everything you put back has the same calories as sugar because sugar doesn't, ha unlike fat, which has two and a half times the calories per gram, sugar has the same amount as complex carbohydrates or protein. So you don't gain anything by putting those back. So you have to put insoluble fibers which you can do, and the food industry is working on that, but there's a limit to that. Or you can put higher sugar molecules that are not metabolized, the so-called polyols. But if you have too many of them, they cause diarrhea. So <laughs> there are problems uh, with, with that, and we've got to be aware of it. It's much better, in fact, to reformulate fat because you can put something else back in which has less calories in because fat's got two and a half times the calories per gram. We also want to reduce the sweetness because... We feel that the sweetness itself, like the saltiness, encourages greater consumption of food. If we did a 50% reduction, it would reduce calorie intake per person per day by 100 kilocalories per day. So you can see that we're trying to work out the evidence to prevent obesity. A lot of the things you read in the newspaper just say, well, we've got to have a tax. When you say, well, what effect will that have? We've got to restrict advertising. What effect will that have? We try to work out what is the science behind it. It's not always that easy. And we must provide a level playing field, et cetera. And, you know, we need – the British Retail Consortium has called for a mandatory policy, that is, a regulated policy. And actually, the food industry prefer that. In South Africa, we helped set up a salt reduction program. The Minister of Health had the right to regulate the food industry built into the Constitution, and the food industry knew this. So he wrote to them all, and do you want a voluntary or a regulatory system? And 29 out of 30 companies wanted their regu regulated system – because they want a level playing field. They want to make sure all their rivals have to do the same thing so they're not reducing something, the other one's staying the same, and they get a, an advantage, or maybe a disadvantage, depending on what the population prefers. And again, we need huge amount of publicity to get the politicians and the food industry to move. And you've seen that in the last two years from our action on sugar. You know, it gets a bit boring after a while. We put out these surveys and things, sugar, 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 you know. Uh, but that's what you've got to do to get action. 
other actions, obviously, we want to get reformulation of fat, as I've said, particularly saturated fat. In the long term, banning market of all unhealthy food, reduce portion size, tax, and we've got that already. But of course, the tax is very small. If you think cigarette tax now is 800% of the sale price, 800%. Now, if you think uh, we put the same tax on Coca-Cola, that would mean a bottle of Coca-Cola would cost roughly six to eight pounds. Now, that would really seriously impair uh, sugar, sweet, and Coca-Cola sales, right? So when you read in the industry, a, a tax doesn't have any effect. It depends on what level the tax is. <laughs> and it, we will get that eventually, but it will take, you have to be patient. You can't get it tomorrow, you know. They're not, you know, imagine the protests would be, but you gradually, gradually, and the Treasury has the, has the right to uh, I incrementally it can uh, escalate the tax without going to the commons. It, it, once it's got the tax, it can then increase it without any reference to anyone. So not that they're planning to do that, but they are planning to do it, but they won't tell you that officially. Because they make a lot of money for it. So this is the... Cameron, of course, has now taken over the obesity plan for the UK. And we've been trying to invigorate him. A somewhat difficult man to invigorate, I might say. Uh, and, of course, it's been delayed by the <coughs> EU referendum. But you can see what we've got here. I won't bore you with this. Sugar incremental reduction in five years. Only healthy foods <coughs> promoted and advertised. That will take time. It will be a restrictions on advertising that gradually come in. We've already got this here. All public, uh, particularly schools, hospitals, and all <coughs> government sectors. And that's quite a proportion of food that's eaten in the, in the and, and a proper... Uh, uniform code, you know, so we, people can actually see what they're eating. And now we have about six different ways of showing that. Not that that has much effect, but it's important to have it to make sure we can compare things easily. Um, this, on the, the modelling we've done, would reduce by at least 100 kilocalories for sugar, 100 kilocalories for fat. The other actions are less effective, but probably 50. So it will remove 250 kilocalories if all of that was done. But, of course, there's quite a lot of... We realise there'd be seepage on these things. They won't all get done. But that would be more than sufficient to prevent obesity and type 2 diabetes. So you can see how you can quite easily formulate a plan that would work with the food industry, would allow them to make other foods that are just, you know, would be less profitable, would still make a lot of money, and still survive. So we're not trying to get rid of the food industry. And this is the global food industry. This is... This is the real big players. Of course, in the UK, the supermarkets play a big role, but they tend to support uh, more healthy food. And the, the, the thing is that, that, that although these people are killing us at the moment, the many of the companies are aware of it, and they want to be pushed into doing something. You may have read recently that, that Mars, that is privately owned, actually, is trying to do various healthy things. How far they're doing it is in public relations. Heinz have been doing quite a lot. Unilever have been doing a bit, but again, very good on the public relations. Kraft, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo is a bit better than I Nestle are quite responsible. It, you, you know, it varies and, uh, again, but it isn't as though the food industry isn't aware of this problem and they want to do something. It's only some companies, like Coca-Cola, are not prepared to do anything, but maybe we'll discuss that. So this is the key to it, in our view, reformulation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Graham, for that brilliant talk. Uh, it's, it's slightly disconcerting talk at times, but it was brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, any questions for Graham? Yeah, the back. There's a roving mic, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you've talked about reducing uh, sugar, fat, and salt levels. Yeah. But what is your opinion, or is there any evidence of the effects of um, artificial preservatives, colours and sweeteners on the body, and the gut flora in particular, especially as they're so wi widely used in processed foods? Well, yeah, I mean, that, the, you know, the everyone says, you know, these artificial things and so on. Uh, the evidence they're dangerous is pretty weak, to be honest, and obviously looked at it carefully. There is some evidence in mice that some of the artificial sweeteners may 
may um, uh, alter the gut flora, uh, but the evidence in humans is zero. Uh, obviously, we're aware of the, the this is the, the microbes you have in your colon seem to play an important role in some aspects of disease. I, I think the role has been grossly exaggerated myself, but there is there's no doubt it's an area of great interest. We, we don't fully understand it. Uh, but I, my own view, it's like organic food. I mean, there's absolutely no point in buying organic food unless it tastes better. There's no chemical reason why that food is any better for you than any other. And, and I think a lot of these artificial things are, are not that dangerous. I mean, the salt is far more dangerous, and that is regarded as natural. And it's not. It's dug up from the ground, shoved into our food. That's killing, killing millions of people, whereas the E numbers are not killing millions of people. But we need to keep a close eye on it, and there are things being put into food that potentially could be dangerous. So, I mean, I don't disagree with you, but I think the evidence so far is pretty limited. Um, is there any uh, evidence that uh, the level of alcohol use in the population is growing and if that has any effect on the hidden sugar levels of people uh, in modern society, given stress yeah. levels? Well, I was deliberately avoiding... Relying on a pint of beer or a <laughs> bottle of wine. Deliberately avoiding alcohol. It's a rather contentious subject. I mean, in terms of the risk of alcohol, there is some evidence <coughs> on uh, that it may be beneficial in preventing cardiovascular disease. Uh, but uh, And sometimes the risks of it are slightly exaggerated because one of the problems is that when you ask people, in fact, same for sugar, when you say, uh, well, how many sugar-sweetened drinks? If you say, how much do you drink? If someone asks me how much do I drink and, you know, how many units? Well, first of all, I have no idea what a unit is, even though I know a lot about alcohol. Um, and uh, I'm going to say roughly a third of what I really drink. So I, I drink one to two glasses of wine a day, you see. Well, then you, you come out of this survey that one to two glasses of wine a day are causing cirrhosis and so on, which is absolute rubbish. So they never state that. Again, same thing with sugar. If we look at the amount of sugar-sweetened drinks consumed in the UK, it's, it's uh, compared to the actual sales, it's about 30 to 40 percent less. The alcohol is much more. So that's one thing I'd say. But alcohol is an important source of calories. There's no doubt about that and obviously is playing a role in obesity partly because if you have alcohol, there's a lot of calories, and it also encourages you to eat more uh, or drink, you know. So, that yeah, you're right, it is an issue. It's one we don't really discuss because of the difficulties of it, and we are doing something about alcohol in the UK, I'm pleased to say, because obviously it has huge social problems, and people do get addicted to it, absolutely no doubt about it, and they lose their jobs, have marital problems, etc., etc. So there's no doubt that alcohol is very harmful in excess, but in moderation, provided it's part of your diet, which sounds a bit like the food industry, where you have anything in your diet, provided it's only once or twice a year or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a contentious subject. Um, you, you know, you've made a very good case for government intervention in, the, in, in the setting up things like the salt reduction program. I, in relation to trying to reduce cholesterol, blood cholesterol, uh, why do you think the government seems to be slow in taking that up in trying to deal with the population, whereas it's asking all of us to take statins? Sorry, I didn't hear the last bit. Uh, so it's, it, the government's, you know, trying to get deal with the cholesterol level, it seems to me, by... Yeah. Um, promoting the use of statins, why not encourage people to get their cholesterol down through better diet? Well, yeah, of course, that's going back to the, the, all the old arguments, you know. That, yeah, sure, you can, you can get your cholesterol down and tell you how to do it. You, know, you don't need any saturated fat at all, no milk products, no butter, no cheese, no processed meals full of this. You know, all the dairy cream that's been taken out is stuffed back into all those meals to make them richer. And, you know, uh, and, and then no palm oil, biscuits, cakes, all that. And we're very skilled at getting you as an individual, I get your cholesterol down by one or two million oils, which is the same, not as much as a statin, but a reasonably good reduction, but you need to have a statin as well. But the point is that we're looking at populations. You see, if you shift the population 
level of cholesterol, you have a huge benefit compared to treating a few individuals. That's th it's a different way of looking at things. And, you know, in an individual, the fall in your salt intake that's occurred in the UK hasn't affected your blood pressure very much. And if you had high blood pressure, it's not sufficient. We're not saying that. But if you shift the whole population down, it reduces the risk across the population, and, and that has a big effect. And I think you, you, appreciate, you agree with me. Because yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's not an easy concept to, to grasp, actually. And, and a lot of doctors have difficulty in grasping it, too. Uh, the population measures are just as effective as individual treatments. In terms of what's happened to cholesterol, it has come down over the last 15 years because we've switched from, <coughs> there has been a switch from saturated fat to polyunsaturated monoamines, and that's brought down the cholesterol by 0.5, and that has reduced the numbers, it's played a role in reducing the number of heart attacks, particularly in strokes. Mm. But cholesterol is the forgotten subject, and also partly because of a very effective drug, telluric statins which, are, and again, there's been a lot of publicity about them, but if you want my view, it's a load of rubbish. I mean, it, there are side effects with statins, but when people who develop side effects were put in a very well-controlled study, really double-blind study, were re-randomized to either a statin or placebo. So you had people on a statin with side effects, right? You then randomized them to either a placebo or continue with a statin. They didn't know which they were on there was an equal number of side effects in the placebo group as compared to the statin group, which clearly shows that a lot of those, a lot of those symptoms are not real. Yeah. There's no doubt you do get occasional side effects, but this uh, campaign by the British Medical Journal about it is completely wrong. I mean, we, we've treated thousands of people with statins and high blood pressure, and very few of them get problems. Of course, we're treating an elderly population, and all of us, when we get older, tend to have muscle aches, and, oh, God, you know, I can't do what I used to. So it's not surprising, you know. So that's a little bit about statins. Also, the, all the publicity about cholesterol not being important and fat not putting up cholesterol is totally misplaced, in my view, and that sugar somehow causes atheroma. There's absolutely no evidence that sugar plays any role in atheroma at all. There's a, mic there's a microphone coming. Just wait a second. There's a microphone coming. Oh, thank you. <coughs> First of all, let me thank you for a well-balanced and very informative thank lecture. Thank you. It really was worth coming to hear. But I was uh, research and engineering director of yeah. Unilever from, yeah. uh, from 1981 to yeah. 1990. And to hear the progress that you've made ever since is very, very good. Yeah. And what I did like in your lecture was the emphasis on sugar and salt. Because mm. in, in a firm like Unilever, that's very important. We could control the general formulation and we could influence from the center the fat levels and the content of the fat. Yeah. But the amount of sugar and the amount of salt was left to the local firms selling yeah. the product. And so what you've done is to show that it's now really getting to those firms, which the essential of companies can't do, and really producing good effects. How will this carry on, <coughs> or are you likely to think that you've reached a limit? No, I don't think we've reached the limit. I mean, I think, you know, you can go on and people get used to it. I mean, the, the, you know, it becomes increasingly difficult to persuade the food industry to do it. But the, if you do it slowly, like we've done, they don't really notice it. It's a, it's a sort of screwing down slowly so that each time you make a reduction, it's quite small. But when you look back over 10 years, you've made quite a big reduction. Yeah. So I, I don't, I mean, you know, we can't take all the salt out or all the sugar out of foods. That would be unrealistic. But we can get it down by 50, 60 percent given time. Uh, it takes time. Now, whether that will solve all our problems, uh, I don't think it will. We need other things. And we need to encourage firms like Unilever to make much more healthy food uh, rather than some of the things you still make like cup soups and instant, you know, those awful, what is that chef used to advertise, it so irritate me, stock, stock, not stock cubes, they have some new thing, stock pots, which have got huge amounts of salt and it's just an expensive way of buying salt basically. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But I have a question about Scotland. Would you say the UK is in the lead on this? It's certainly leading on salt. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We we led. The, well, Finland, of course, did do a salt reduction things in the 1970s, which was very difficult to find out exactly what they'd done. But they had big reductions in salt uh, from about four, much higher than us, 14 grams to about nine. Big reductions in stroke and heart. It was part of a general program in Finland to. Uh, reduce smoking, increase fruit and vegetable fat. So there were lots of things going on, but they were very successful. They've given up in the last 15 years, which is a bit sad. I don't quite know why. I think the power of the global food industry moving in. And of course, you see that in Europe, that the, the food industry dominates the EU, the lobbying that goes on there. Almost impossible to get anything done in the EU. Not, I'm not telling you which way to vote. <laughs> A question about carbohydrates and sugar. You mentioned the relationship yeah. because carbohydrates are sugar plus a little bit. Yeah. Um, two examples. My dentist swears that in terms of dental caries, mm. carbohydrates, for example, eating crisps, is much worse than drinking a Coke because actually if you drink a glass of water after Coke, you wash away the sugar very easily. But the uh, carbohydrate will stick in the insta interstices of your, of, of your teeth. That's number one. But number two, when you said replacing the sugar in biscuits uh, with carbohydrate and cereal, for mm. example, would be a bad thing. Would it be absolutely a bad thing in that it won't all, the carbohydrate will, some of it will be excreted, some of it is a bit of fiber anyhow. Mm. It will taste worse, of course, and people perhaps wouldn't dip them in their tea anymore. <laughs> but I would have thought it is a better uh, alternative to um, nothing at all. Well, y yeah, if you put complex carbohydrates with with fiber in, yeah, some of it is not is excreted, and you don't you don't get the calories. So that's correct. I think in terms of <coughs> substitution and taking the sugar out, I think you know you. you I mean, I I never liked sugar. I don't, I I never eaten it um, because after the war there was rationing of sugar, so you had very little, uh, and probably had quite a healthy diet because you had a lot of salt there. Um, and I find all these biscuits are far too sweet. We've got used to far too much sugar in the food. We're all addicted to sugar now. So you can definitely get it down a long way. And, and you, you, you know, the salt content of those biscuits have come down, but you haven't noticed. So we could reduce the sugar so you wouldn't notice, in fact. That's the beauty of it. The only thing you do notice is if you go abroad uh, uh, to Europe or other countries, you notice how salty the food tastes because you're not used to all that salt. And that, that is the only problem. And of course, with patients, we tell them to take, if they're on blood pressure tablets, we tell them to take uh, what's called a diuretic, which gets rid of the salt. Um, and if they go to Portugal or Spain, uh, they, they take a small dose of diuretic, and that gets rid of all the salt. But we're not suggesting that as a population move. Uh, uh, Professor, um, I can just speak. Okay. Um, we corresponded some moons ago where I remember mentioning a uh, dreaded word. I'm almost scared to mention it in present company, but Marmite. Marmite. Uh, oh, right. You're of a Marmite, eh? Uh, um, I, my children were addicted to it, and so was yeah. I. And then I, I peeled off the little label on the top yeah. and found out it's 10.8% salt. Yeah. Not only has that remained, mm. but now the nutritional label is hidden in the packaging on the top of the Marmite yeah. jar, so you have to damage the packaging to find out <laughs> that it's 10.8% salt. Um, I've switched to, uh, we can't get away from it, to Vegemite, where the label's right on the front by Kraft Sushard. Mm -hmm. Right on the front, you can see it's 8.5% salt, but at least mm -hmm. I'm told up front, is that not illegal under the current legislation to hide the amount of salt? Well, it can't be illegal because it, they would the trade, I mean, it, you know, you could write to them and ask them, I have no idea, but I mean, the trading standards officers, that's something they should be looking at if, if, if it's illegal, but I mean, obviously a lot of transgressions occur without anyone picking up, so I'd write to Marmite suggesting that. I mean, <coughs> one of the ways, when you look at the salt label on food, it's very complicated to understand the amount. I'll give you a simple clue. That is, is that, that's the salt content, is it? In it the was, yes. Yeah. So 2.5 grams of salt per 100 grams is seawater, yeah. right? So you're the Marmite or the veg, the Marmite you're having is three or four, four times, times the concentration of seawater, and the Vegemite is two or three times. Now, do you really want? Do you really want your children to eat that? No. Um, no we'll stop I, it. I did. I, did <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I did. I did um, write to Unilever, which you just met last time, yeah. and uh, from their via their Facebook page, and they did actually come back with a pre a pro forma advice, yeah. which simply said there's less than a gram of salt in each teaspoon of the product, and there were no inclinations to change it. When I mentioned about the packaging, it all went quiet. Yeah, well, I, I don't think it's. I think it's no longer made by Unilever. I think they sold it off because they're a bit embarrassed by it. But I'm not sure now. But the the point is that 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 isn't the point. The when you eat that, it's incredibly salty, and that means your children will like other foods that are incredibly salty. This is the thing. We need to get down the salt concentration as well as the amounts, and that's the argument you should get with whoever's making it, because those very salty foods lead you to add more salt or take other salty foods because it doesn't suppress the taste receptors. Another interesting thing is PepsiCo, in reducing their crisps, they've reduced all the their snacks by 30%. But they did that by well, the ones that are sprayed on. They sprayed on a finer crystal, which is more quickly dissolved, and therefore you get a more salty taste with less salt. So they reduce the salt, but they still have the same salty taste. Now, that's not a good thing to do, because other crisps that haven't done that taste less salty. And another, the other way around, just let me illustrate that, is you know all these chefs use these big crystals of sea salt? They are very dangerous. And you can take one, put it on your tongue, it doesn't taste salty at all because it takes time for the crystal to dissolve, get to the salt taste receptor. So that's why the chefs like them because they don't taste disgustingly salty. So they shove this stuff on, but all that goes into your body and is actually absorbed as salt. So you think you're not eating it, and you are. You're eating vast amounts. So it's very dangerous what... Jamie Oliver's and, and you know, all these people are sprinkling these crystals around. Obviously, if you dissolve it in the food, then that's different. Thank you. Hi. Um, that was a really Hi. good talk. I just wanted to ask um, your opinion on a local level. How can we encourage food outlets or retailers that are small businesses to reformulate what they're selling? Well, it's a very good point. I mean, we've, we've thought very carefully about it. Obviously, the chain restaurants, chain takeaways are easy to deal with. Uh, but we do have <coughs> some work going on, particularly involving environmental health officers or trading standard officers who are taking a much greater interest in nutrition because food poisoning is a relatively small cause of death compared to what I'm talking about tonight. And they've got that message on. The problem is, like all local councils, they're grossly overstretched, far too much to do, no money, and so on. So it's quite difficult for them. But there are, there's certainly in some areas, they're working quite closely to uh, try and get that advice across to individual restaurants and takeaways. But I think the last time we looked, there are over 100,000 individually owned restaurants or takeaways. So quite difficult to get to all of them. So it is a problem, not only here, but in, in, in developing countries and in all countries. How do you get to these individual uh, people to get them to do something about it? And of course, they can't measure the salt, whereas McDonald's and Kentucky are, are relatively easy to deal with. Given the uh, number of people who spend uh, significant amounts of time in hospital, what's realistically being done about the quality of food in hospitals? Because it's really well, quite poor. I mean, you know, this is an important point. I think, I think the hospitals act as an icon. They should be giving health and food. In actual fact, when you're acutely ill in hospital, it, your major problem is getting enough food. You know, and we show when I was at St George's uh, that showing the ground round that, that, that most of the patients were starving in the hospital. They were getting inadequate in calorie intake and yet they were having major operations and things and, and they needed more calories. So, I mean, I, and I, I said, why aren't they allowed to order takeaways? You know, they, they have to bring <laughs> someone to bring them in. And it doesn't really matter what you eat when you're very ill. You just need calories, you know. But I agree with you that hospital, uh, long-term stay, children and so on, obviously need to, but they should act as an example to other people. And the good thing is that we do at the moment have a very good chief executive of the NHS, Stevens, Simon Stevens, 
who's not a civil servant, and that is a breath of fresh air when you deal with these people because they're all subservient to the minister or prime minister. And he's doing, he is starting to do something in hospitals, making sure the food that's sold in hospitals is more healthy and the food served in the hospitals more healthy. So I think it's important to show that hospitals do have healthy food. And obviously the staff as well, they, they, they should have healthy food and they should be acting as an example to other people. And they need education. I mean, you know, nurses and many doctors have probably the worst diet of anyone in the world. Well, they have to buy in takeaways. You know, well, I remember when he was doing acute medical intakes, the student would go out and buy a whole lot of pizza takeaways. Uh, the funny story was one was coming back with about 10 takeaways, and this was in Tooting Broadway, which is not exactly the best area to walk alone in at night, and some guy came out and took the whole lot off him. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to go reimburse him and get some more. Uh, that's a bit irrelevant. All oh, right. Okay. Well, <laughs> don't talk about the calories. In it. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I just wondered what your views were on the saturated fat and um, its links with raising cholesterol. Sorry, obviously, I can't hear exactly. Sorry. The um, the new evidence that's now been shown with saturated fat and raising oh cholesterol. Right, yeah, okay, yeah. I wondered, as a cardiologist, and we know from. Uh, We've all, I'm a nutritionist, so I've always told you know, a lot of people how bad saturated fat is, and I just wondered what your thoughts are now on the, the well, this new evidence. Well, to go into detail takes a lot of time. I mean, the problem is that what are called dietary cohort studies, where you measure something, so you measure the fat, right, and then you follow them up and see what happens to them. Now, firstly, it's almost impossible to find out how much saturated fat someone's eating. The dietary questionnaires are useless at determining you know, how much saturated fat you're eating right now compared to unsaturated and what proportion of your diet is. So the measurement's useless, right? Then you have a big problem that when people die, they don't eat food. So they're not eating any fat, right? So you have what's called reverse causality. And this has been a problem in all these studies that they often show there was a big thing with cholesterol. Low cholesterol is said to be dangerous. It was then being shown this was in the 90s, that it was due to people with cancer because people with cancer metabolize the cholesterol and have very low cholesterol, but it wasn't the cause of their death. They already had the cancer. So you can see that these studies are incredibly weak and we don't really pay any attention to dietary cohort studies, but some dietary nuts do and use them to say this is the end of the world. You know. But you have to look at all the evidence. There's very good metabolic evidence that Saturated fat puts up cholesterol. If you cut your saturated, it comes down. There's huge evidence that cholesterol relates to vascular disease. And we've now got three ways of lowering cholesterol with different drugs that all show the same reduction in mortality for a given reduction in cholesterol. So it must be due to that fall in cholesterol we get the reduction in mortality. So, you know, based on that sort of evidence, it's overwhelming. But we get the same thing for salt as well. There are cohort studies showing that eating less salt is dangerous and so on. But when you go into the studies, they're rubbish. But people don't read. They're not trained to look at the, the real detail of the science behind how they worked out what you're eating. And anyway, what you eat now doesn't mean what you're eating in 10 years' time. Hi. Uh, there's moderation in eating and drinking, and there's fasting. I wonder if you could say a bit about what might be the relationship to unhealthy food. Sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Okay. There's moderation in eating and drinking, yeah. and then there's fasting, like fasting annually for six weeks or so forth. In terms of if a person continued to eat unhealthy food, what would be the relationship between the two things I talked about? About I don't fasting, the, fasting in particular. Exactly. Can you encapsulate the question? Okay. Does fasting annually 
um, reduce the accumulated effects of unhealthy eating. Would fat reduction? Uh, fasting. Fasting. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I couldn't. Uh, my hearing's not too good. Um, yeah, fasting. Well, you know, yes. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, it, it can do. Of course, the best example is the guy I trained with who was in a prison of war camp in the Burma Railway as a doctor, and they were all starving. Officers treated slightly better, but um, they. Um, they, they got cholera, typhoid, and everything. And, of course, that cleans out your arteries absolutely completely. Same as alcoholics. When you're alcoholic, you, d you have very poor nutrition. You don't eat any fat. And you, the great classic thing at post-mortem is all the arteries are totally clean. You've cleared out all the atheroma because, you, you know. And certainly for those people who survived and didn't get other complications, uh, and he lived to 98, was working to the day he died with a completely clear mind. So he had probably no atheroma whatsoever. So certainly that sort of fasting will do it. But, you know, a, a couple of weeks fasting, I've no idea. Or if you Ramadan, I don't know how long it lasts for. But, you know, it, it wouldn't have a big effect. I don't think you can kid yourself that starving for a few months is going to cure you. No, <laughs> sorry.